Happy Valentine, everyone. Nice day. Good. D Y S L E X I A. He give anything to make it go away. Even though he knows it. Buckets, he won't give up. No, no. Cause you know he's way too tough. He's gonna do whatever it takes. He's gonna find a way. Casey never liked school much All the kids would laugh when he read in class Teachers tried to help him out but They didn't know what to do so they just let it pass Hello! Happy Valentine's Day! I was so eager to wish you all a happy Valentine's Day Good to see you all Thank you Praise for joining in Oziyama EK, thank you. Uh, Mr. Alex, good to have you, thank you. Vicky Wilson, everyone, thank you so, so, so much. How has your day been? It's the beginning of a new week. I hope we're all ready for a very fulfilling one. Once again, I want to thank everyone for joining us on the 49th episode of Finding Help with Special Needs. And today's topic is love, relationships, and disabilities. I love love, and I love love-related stories and issues. So today, we are so privileged to have three amazing women that will be joining us. We have um, a, a relationship, marriage, and a sex coach with us today. We have a beautiful woman, Auntie Bolani, with us she has a, a teenager with special needs, and we have to be loved by Ajayi, who is living with cerebral palsy. And together, we will be talking about, we will be diving into the issue of love, relationships, and disabilities. So thank you once again for joining us today on the 49th episode of Finding Up with Special Needs. I want you to like, subscribe, and turn on your notification icon so that each time we come up every Sunday, you are sure that we are here to kiss it out to you hot, hot as it ought to be when it comes to issues of special needs and disability and anything that has to do with special needs. So welcome once again, relax and let's, let's have a good time as I bring in our guests. So they're all ready for us today. Let me bring them all in. Hello, Auntie Volale, good to have you. Good afternoon. Thanks for having good me. Good afternoon. Ooh, Toby Lover, good to see you. Hi, Lola. Hi, Atabali. Good to see everyone. Hello, Toby Lover. Oh. Nice to see you. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's <laughs> Day. Happy Valentine's Day. I'm really Day. excited. I'm always excited, but today is a special kind of excitement because it's a love, love day. <laughs> Okay, so while we wait for um, Coach Jennifer to join us, we would um, want you to please introduce yourselves. So, who's going first? Anyone can go first. I think I'm gonna leave. Everybody's gonna, okay. <laughs> Toby, you're here. Just go. Okay, so okay. I'm not necessarily new to the show. So, True. let's see. Short version. Um, so I like to say that I'm a disability management advocate. I run an organization called the Let Cerebral Palsy Kids Learn Foundation to promote inclusive education for children with cerebral palsy in Nigeria. And of course beyond, but hey, I like to start from home. Um, so what else? Yeah, so I have... <laughs> yeah, I always, I always go, okay, what else? Okay, so yes, I do have a first and second degree in law um and i'm a published author of four books and counting uh, Lola, i think i tried that's enough Let's... i love and I love your red top thank you for coming out in red and when i go back to your glasses please while you're done just package it to abuja it looks so beautiful you know? <laughs> that's if you get that's yes. if i don't collect it before you share <laughs> <laughs> I tried to go all red for today, True. Valentine's Day. It's one of my favorite days in the 
yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited. So my name is Bolanle Adewale. Um, I am first a mother. I'm a mother of um, a very handsome, 17, almost 18 years old um, son with autism. And um, I am also a teacher. I'm a teacher at The Learning Place uh, and the founder also of The Learning Place Montessori School in Lekki, as well as The Learning Place Center. It's a day school for boys and girls living with autism and other related developmental disorders. So that's why I'm pretty, and I'm also a behavior analyst, um, also an advanced certified autism specialist. I mean, we could go on, but I'm just here to enjoy myself and to learn and share with you all today. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. And we have our coach here. You know, it's very rare to have such coaches in the house. So we have coach Hello. Jennifer with us. Please introduce yourself to us. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you for being prepared. Oh, you're welcome. It's Valentine's after all. All right. <laughs> My name is Elio jo Jennifer Amuneni. Um, I'm a relationship and sex coach. Um, I'm also a human resource consultant. I have um, a book I'm working on presently. It's about to be published. On The title is Just Before You Get Hitched. A guideline to crushing your marriage goals. There are a lot of things I want to say, but I just want to keep it brief. Um, I'll just focus off career and every other thing. I really love yoga and I do that a lot. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of sex and coaching relationship therapy and i love climbing trees hmm. Whoa. Hmm. <laughs> interesting I said i was going to keep it brief so tree talking about climbing. climbing trees climbing trees is it true that you cannot climb an udara tree now if you climb i've not tried that one so i won't know <laughs> <laughs> wow well, today's going to be interesting i can feel it already thank you so much and mr alex thank you for always always ensuring that this show is an inclusive one I truly appreciate you. We all appreciate you. Thank you for always being with us. So let's get to the gist of today. Our topic is love, relationship, and disabilities. And one of the reasons we talk to talk about it today, of course, obviously, today is a love day, Valentine's Day. But when we talk about disability or special needs, we always think of the disability first and the special needs first before we remember that in, these individuals are first human beings and they go through everything that every human being goes through before the disability. So they're human first. And today we talk to talk about this issue. And I'm going to keep it so real. We're going to keep it so real. Thankfully, and Polala said to us, she has a teenager, a young adult living with autism. And of course, we know teenage years, hormones flies here and there. We have crush on people. We have to be loved by the house. She's an adult living with cerebral palsy. Toby and I had spoken about relationship issues. I said some, some things I can't even, well, we're going to talk about it today. I can't even imagine that somebody would say that to an individual, you know. And we're going to talk about that today. But most of all, apart from we sharing our experiences and talking about the way forward, we have a coach who's going to be our referee and going to direct us in the right way. She's also in the house. She also shared a few things with me today. I'm like, wow. So today... We're going to be going first to having um, Auntie Bolali talk to us about um, what it was like. I mean, what it is like from, because I knew when I was like 13, I'm going to use myself as an example, 13 year old, you're wondering what's happening, you know, puberty set in, you're beginning to um, look at the opposite sex and you're wondering, oh, how do I, uh, do I look good? How do I speak to this person? What would I say wrong? How had it been with Muni? through the teenage years when it has to do with relationship or the hormones, the poverty stage and all of that. Could you please tell us what, what that been like? Because a lot of people don't even think that individuals with autism do have such feelings. Oh, wow, they do. And they have very strong feelings at that too. Um, so when he, um, he started to display, well, first and foremost, we know that interpersonal skills is, is, is definitely one of the things that we... Um, expect them to have but being autism it's one of the things they actually lack so um it's it's been more of a contrived effort to try and help money manage anything that has to do with relationships or interpersonal feelings that we may have 
he started to display his feelings around about the age of, I'd say 15, he's 17 now. So for the past two years, we've been dealing with, well, first it's the arousal, you know, uh, like we're keeping it real. So we're breaking, we're going yes. into detail. Yeah, please, the coach is in the house. She would, talk, oh, yes. she would so, so do the referee right today. <laughs> the arousal you know who walk out of his room and you're thinking okay money no 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 go back so we had to work on that so the first thing we did was um we, we prepared a social story for for him to help him understand that certain things are okay in public and certain things have to be managed in your room behind closed doors and he started to learn that even now he's learned it so well to the point that if you go into his room whilst he's having his moment He's going to start screaming, go back, go back, you know, because he knows you're not supposed to see him in that state. But so the first realization for me was, okay, this man, this young man is growing. And obviously he has these feelings. He has an older brother and we try to liken what happened to his older brother at certain ages, you know, so at 15, that he will talk about girls and, you know, although he'll try and manage it some way or the other. So when Moni started to have the arousals, it was only natural. We understood that that was what he was going through. So we prepared social stories to help him manage that. Then it became the actual connection. Moni, I think, started to fancy people in school. And mm. he just had a very awkward way of showing it. So his awkwardness was, um, he would say things to them that would catch them unawares. You know, he would say something like, you're bon bon. Or he would say something like, um, uh, touch, touch your breast or something. You know, he just say something very odd. And with, uh, well, I'm not thinking anything. But in school, initially, he had a problem with it because um, they couldn't, the, other, the girls could not relate with it. And some of them may not have been prepared for it also at the time. So he was always getting into trouble. You know, they'll call us and tell us, oh, he used this word or he's trying to touch people in awkward parts or awkward places. So we had to also then guide him to help him know. So now he knows not to touch them in um, awkward places, but he still will talk about them. He'll talk about his, a particular girl in class. So when he started coming home and was talking about Jemima, at, at this time he wasn't in school in Lagos. So he'll talk about Jemima. We knew there was something for Jemima. So I, I, I had to go to school to meet Jemima because I wanted to know who Jemima was. And thankfully, Jemima's parents were also open to um, us being friends. So we would actually go and visit Jemima, you know, at the weekend. So we'll take Jemima and Moni out to the cinema together, just friends, you know. But they, they were very close. But for me, it was more of him wanting to be in a relationship without knowing how to express it. So mm -hmm. we started to help him with the words, the things to say, don't say this. It's, this is, and so he will tell you now, touch your bum bum is bad. I'll say, well, it depends on how you say it. If you talk about touching your own bum bum, when you need to touch your bum bum, it's fine. But when you talk to somebody and tell them touch your bum bum, it's actually rude. You know, so he, he's now learning the difference between um, the things to know, knowing the right things to say and the right way to go about. So pretty much we're on that. Where we still have a challenge now is, um, especially with the advent of um, the virtual schooling and all these opportunities online. So Moni uses um, the virtual platform for school, but at the same time, he's now exposed to certain things. You know, so now he goes, if you, if you don't catch him quick enough, when he's trying to do his homework on, on um, Google Meet, you find him typing naked. And when he mm -hmm. types naked on Google, you can imagine they're all waiting for him. <laughs> so many different shapes and sizes are waiting for him. And then they pop up and all of that. So that's where we are now. Because even that, I'm thinking, okay, do I take him completely off the um, um, internet? Or he still needs the internet for certain things. So we're trying to balance that. But we also cannot sit around him all the time when he's um, using that. So that is a problem. Because not only is he seeing these naked people, I was just told um, two weeks ago in, in, at the center that Moni actually tried to take off his pants to do what he had seen on the internet. On the internet. So we're at that stage now where okay, I, I thought, okay, we had already crossed some hurdles. The first one was the arousal. He knows where to do it. Then talking to the girls or talking to the people appropriately, he's learning how to do that. He's, he's pretty much doing that well. But now we have a situation of him also managing himself and managing what so indeed there is the room for relationships and we need to nurture it they're only human mm -hmm. the feelings will come but it's about knowing how to channel it and helping them channel it in the proper ways because also they'll feel rejection when rejection comes they would also feel it so we should prepare them for um rejection when it comes it's not everybody you like that's going to like you back 
Mm -hmm. So you need to understand all of that. And um, it, it's just a whole lot of things, but that's where we are yes. pretty much with him. But in terms of him having the needs and wanting to be with other uh, ladies and people of the opposite sex, indeed, yes, he has the urge and he always wants mm -hmm. to, but it's just about managing it and helping him find the right words. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Auntie Bolala. I love the way you spoke about it without holding back. And I noted uh, a few things which I believe Coach um, Jennifer will be able to talk to us about that when we get to Coach Jennifer. But I wanted her to start with our realities and then Coach Jennifer will step in. She also shared one or two stories with me prior to now and she'll also tell us a few things about that. Now, I would like to also say here that whenever we talk about disability or special needs, it's good to have an idea. And that's why we have what we call find out with special needs to just let you know everything about special needs. Look, when it comes to special needs, we have individuals who are, the, their cognitive level might not be the same with some other people, you know. So what Antipolani was explaining about money, not knowing that it's wrong to be in public and touch and just say bum bum. Someone would think it's just being vulgar. But because of the way he is, he's been, his brain and his, he, he is who he is, he, to him, he doesn't say anything wrong in it. He's just being real. Look, I, I was talking to someone, and at first I was trying to, to understand what Asperger syndrome is, you know, how people with, sometimes people with ADHD. So, you know why you're thinking in your mind and say, oh, and this is the truth. You say an ugly lady, and say, mm, in your mind, you're like, this lady is ugly. You're saying in your mind. But most, some individuals with, who have cognitive um, challenges, as opposed to saying it in their mind, they will say it out. It is the truth. But is it socially accepted? No. And that's where we need to understand who they are. They do not mean to be mean or to be vulgar, but this is who they are. We just have to now either be able to accept them for who they are or help them to be able to fit, um, not really fit in, and understand the social norm and what is socially acceptable. Now, we also have people like Toby Ajayi, who is living with cerebral palsy that has nothing to do with her cognitive ability. And I mean, when you hear Toby, Toby speak, I can't, I can't be appear when she's speaking. The English sometimes, I have to open dictionary, you know? So our story might be different from what Andy Balala is saying, but we want to see how it is because <laughs> <laughs> we want to see, uh, tell us your own growing up as a teenager. Your, I mean, with cerebral palsy, it was obvious. We could, I mean, I know your story and how long it took you to, to, to work and all of that. What was it like growing up as a teenager and what was relationship and all of the hormonal issues were like for you? I know for you, it might not have been much, but what were reactions? What was, you know, people's acceptance of you and what was it like? Please share with us. Okay, so let's see. So let's track back a little. Um, one of the first things I think, and, and you would... Um, you probably remember this. I think I shared this last time I was here. Is that my parents, um, they are very deliberate about certain things. And one of it was a lot of social interaction as a child. So, I mean, I went to estate parties. I don't know if they still do those things in estate these days. But, like, there were no parties I was allowed to be excluded from. I pity I pity the. Pe I don't think anybody ever tried it, but I pity the person who would have tried it with my mother. I don't think you'd have lived it down if you had tried to exclude me from an estate party on some level. So already, I mean, I already had so because of that, my social interaction skills were already very well developed. And of course, by the time that you know puberty hit, and you know puberty for girls is a lot more complicated. Um, so yeah, so it's it's things like you're dealing with all of the hair that's growing in all of the awkward places that you didn't used to have hair before. <laughs> so first is like, what is this? And then, of course, the mother of all now starts the whole period drama. <laughs> mm -hmm. Have you guys ever have you guys ever thought about how someone with a movement disorder like cerebral palsy manages a period? Like. It is actually not very funny. It's actually like, I mean, now that I think about it, then it was not funny in any way. Having to actually now figure out how do I, how do I even get my hands to cooperate to fix the pad correctly? Like, and of course, you, and, and I went to like mixed schools. So the worst thing that can happen to you in a mixed school, I mean, if you remember this as a teenager, is for you to get stained in class. Like, that's the mother of all embarrassment. And so those are the kind of things that, apart from even just, you know, 
not even talk, just before I even talk about boys, it was the fact that you also did not you wanted to be able to manage this thing in a way where you didn't embarrass yourself because now you're very self conscious as a girl. Mm-hmm. And Sarah Palsy will embarrass you. So it can become very complicated. So I mean, so I, I remember that my you know, my siblings, my siblings and myself, not really my mom. At this point, my mom was like, Well, yeah, your sisters can figure it out. I think they eventually they eventually sat me down and we figured out a way that worked for my own movement difficulties. I, I think we probably wasted like a whole pack of parts just basically teaching me how to fix it properly. Like it was, that was like an exercise in the zone. Like, we probably spent like a couple of hours just, and my star was like, look, if I have to waste this entire pack, we'll waste it. You, well, you've got to, I mean, you got to nail this thing because you cannot have disgrace yourself in public. And then of course by, say, GS3, so by 13, 14, conversations in class, I just tell you, know, who's pairing up with who, who likes who, who doesn't like who, who does who like, and those conversations were already like kind of conversations you're having. Even in church, self, in teenagers' class in church, self, it was hush hush. You know, <laughs> these conversations are already beginning to happen. And so, of course, you started to kind of like, like boys, and boys started to like you back. The beautiful thing about it was my dad was very open to those conversations. So he, he was mm. the kind of person who would ask point blank, Oh, is there any boy that you like, or is there anybody that likes you? So, he, I mean, so I would, so I, I don't think that there was ever a boy I crushed on that my dad didn't know about. Like, he would be like, okay, so. But well, you know, if we tell your mother now, she's going to have a typical Nigerian mother moment. So let's not tell her. Let's just keep this between us and we'll walk this, you know, we'll walk this journey together. And so I remember that initially, I, and and interestingly, I didn't think that it was, I think I thought I think that it was okay because I mean, because my dad was able to have the conversation with me, I didn't think anything was wrong with liking a boy because my dad didn't say anything was wrong with it. He said it was okay to like a boy, it was okay for a boy to like me back. And I, I, I didn't realize that people did not expect people like me to be in relationships until I was probably until I probably switched schools. Because I, I was I'd been in the same school from preschool to like year nine. So I was already like a veteran there. So I didn't everybody was used to me. I was used to everybody. Then I switched schools in year 10. And when I switched schools in year 10, I remember that the first boy that I had an obvious crush on me, I started looking at him funny, like, why do you like her? And I was wondering, okay, so what's the issue? What's wrong with him liking me? And that I think that was the first time I realized, oh. There's something called stigma, and this stigma cuts across everything, including relationships. So people don't expect people like you to be in relationships. And so they kind of say he's all of a sudden, any guy that's with you is suddenly crowned a hero. Huh? Uh, please, let's be guided. <laughs> I, got I remember the first time, you know, there was, there was this song and dance about how the guy was a hero. I was like, let's be guided. Which which villain did he did he slay that made him be because I'm not understanding. Let's just let's get it. you know so um very early on I guess again like I always say it's also about how you how you also present yourself. I very early on I knew I had choices. I mean I did not have to like everybody that liked me and so if I not like that, not like the guy, I'll tell him point blank that I not like him. Moving on. And mm-hmm. you, you, I've always been someone who believed, and my dad always used to tell me, like, you have choices. I mean, you've always had mm-hmm. choices. So nobody should ever tell you that you don't. Um, and that, look, you obviously are a gift to the world. And if you believe that, nobody's going to treat you less than that. And so for me, that I carried that into every relationship I went into, so I could never really understand the. So that was why I always had a narrative, had an issue with the whole narrative around ah, and so when I see you know all the stories that fly across social media about some able bodied person in a relationship or married to somebody who's disabled, and then you suddenly start crowning the able bodied person as a saint or a hero or ah he's trying or she's trying i'm like i don't understand like 
I don't get. <laughs> this makes no sense to me. We are two people who decide to go into a relationship. We mm-hmm. both bring mm-hmm. something to the table mm-hmm. and we both have value that we have inherently, mm-hmm. not just because we are in a relationship, but as individuals, we already had value. You brought the value together and somebody is a hero for being with the other. I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> but again, as, in, as I've continued to work and I've continued to also listen, I've then realized that society does not, for some reason, society somehow thinks that especially when it's the especially when you're female with a disability, society somehow thinks that because you know the female is supposed to be the carer, you know, by societal standards, right? Mm-hmm. So female female do the caring, right? So the minute that you're the person who by some stroke of genius needs care, it may, automatically means that you're not worth being. So I, it, it was in kind of understanding that thinking that got me to finally understand why people could think that way. And people could say, oh, you know, people, people like you shouldn't be expecting to be in relationships. And so I've, I've come to that realization that, I mean, people are so focused on the impairments that they they forget about the person, the person who has emotions, who has thoughts, who has desires, who has choices, choices about who they want to spend their time with, how they want to spend it, what they think, what they don't think. Um, And it's important that I think, again, I'll say this again, I've said it before, parents have a humongous role to play in this. You, parents, you know, I don't think a lot of parents realize that how they speak to their children become their children's in a way, become the way children mm-hmm. into, mm-hmm. as in how they learn to speak to themselves and kind of how they carry it into adulthood. So when I think about it now, people say, oh, Toby is extremely picky about even the kind of men she dates. I'm like, absolutely. Have you ever listened to my father talk to me? Like, I'm sorry, but man, the guy raised the bar very early. I mean, I, I remember my first, like, official date date, kind of, you know, wear a dress, go to a five-star restaurant date, was my dad and myself. So, I'm sorry, please. Like, I don't understand. <laughs> You've got to be able to kind of match that or beat that before you're exactly, you know, making me all go go ahead about it. So, it's about how much value even parents, you know, and people who are in positions of authority around teenagers with special needs give them. Now, now tie into the value that they give themselves going forward. And and it's it's important that we do this because the truth is that um, people with disabilities are at much higher risk for intimate partner violence. And a lot of people stay in those relationships because they feel like this person already did them a favor. And so they are so happy yeah. to leave. So it's important that we help our teenagers with disabilities, especially, have a very high sense of their own worth before mm-hmm. they even get into relationships. So that when they do, they know when to get out when it's no longer saving. I'll stop. Thank you so much, Toby. Thank you. I just love all my guests. Every time they come on board, they do it the way we want it done, which is keeping it real. Thank you, Auntie Bolale, once again. Thank you, Toby. And from all that you've said, for me, you said it that whether a person is with disability or not, that sense of I am enough, but it doesn't mm. just jump on the person, the parent. The, and I always say it in everything, so, um, socially, everything that has to do with them, um, what culturally, Whatever it is, a family unit has a, a big role to play, really, with whether the person living with disability or not. So I'm bringing it back to Coach Jennifer. Um, and when I had spoken about Moni's experience, Toby Lover had spoken about experience. And like I said earlier on, it doesn't matter with or without disability. So the question to you now, Coach Jennifer, is um, how do we prepare young teenagers? an adult, adult for puberty and relationship because it also comes from puberty to, you know, 
and like that, you know what, what that is called professionally, but how do we prepare? Whether the person living with disability or not, how do we do even we I, I mean I'm sure if individuals without disability also deal with rejection and all of that. How do we deal with all how what is the ideal thing? Or is it, I don't think the right what to say, but what should we look out for and how should we uh, begin to equip teenagers to prepare for poverty and relationships? Okay, um before I answer your question. I'd like to just say I like what um, Mrs. Bolanley is doing, and I especially like what um, Toby's parents did. I agree with you. The fundamental thing is family and parents, because if you grow up understanding yourself what, you realize that there's nothing anybody can say that can put you down. Whether you are disabled or you are just normal. For me, every human is normal. It's just that some of us are more normal than others, but it's still the fundamental need of every human being is love. Love is a fundamental need, love and acceptance. So the way Mrs. Bolande has been guiding her son and teaching him these things is not, a lot of parents do not have patience. Even parents that have children that are not disabled, mm -hmm. they're not very patient. And then having a child that, um, has special needs, takes extra patience. So to be able to guide her son, it means it's going to be easier for him to understand these feelings because she understands it. Mm -hmm. I know I had a friend when I was younger that had um, Down syndrome. And now he's older now, so he has a home in Kano for children with autism and Down syndrome. Like it's um, like an orphanage setting, like so there was one time one of the teenagers came because I served in Kano 2009. So I used to go to that place from time to time. One of the teenagers came from school one day. He was 14. He was just shouting, Leila, 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 Leila. I remember because I was at the opening gen, I was serving with MTN. So I was closing pretty early. So I branched to say hello. And the, the boy kept shouting, Leila, Leila, Leila. So I was like, this boy must really like Leila. Who is Leila? And I don't understand how to deal with children with Down syndrome or autism. I just enjoy being around children, irrespective of whether you have special needs or not, because I teach Sunday school in church. So I've always been somehow around children. So I just told uh, my older friend that owned the orphanage that this Leila, maybe he likes Leila. Then he now said he does not know but that, he, that every time he sleeps at night in the morning, he always wakes up arose for the past one month. <laughs> then I now said he has been seeing Leila in his dream. Then in front of me, he's now started guiding, telling him, okay, it's normal for you to like. Who is Leila? He now says school. It means they are attending the same school. And Leila is in his heart. That's how what he said. So it was, for me, it was an interesting interaction to watch the dynamics between him and that boy so before abraham maslow already said it that apart from food clothing and shelter one of the most basic needs is acceptance is love and acceptance so love and acceptance has nothing to do it's not a, a like a he's not afraid of color or it's not a selection of color skin type whether you have special needs or you, are not, you don't have special needs. It can arrest anybody. So I like to just say parents have the work to do. First, understanding that these things are normal. Sometimes we, especially a parent with um, kids with special needs, we, we want to shield our children so much. That's why I like what, is it Toby? Let me not make a mistake. Dad was doing. Giving her a platform to express herself and say you are worthy of this law. It doesn't matter what your disabilities or shortcomings are. Even we, normal human beings, we have shortcomings. If you have a nasty character, it's the same thing with having Down syndrome, eh? because it's a limitation. That's how I see it in my head. So the work is with parents. Sometimes we shield our children, especially when they have special needs. You're like, uh, you know, I don't, this, my child is very delicate. I don't want the world to judge them or to insult them. You are indirectly, if you are hiding them from the world or from expressing their feelings, you are indirectly telling them that, no, you don't have to show yourself outside. And you'll begin mm -hmm. to grow with that inferiority complex somehow, like, 
Why shouldn't I express myself? So we cannot shield them from everything. Shielding them meaning you don't want them to grow. And you'll not be there all the time. So I always say the best thing is to do, the best thing to do, whether you have children with special needs or not, is allow them to express themselves. Tell them at a certain age, especially when they are heading towards when they start seeing their messes or when mm. they're heading towards the party, you explain according to how you can interact. Because the way I'll interact with my child is not the way a parent with special needs child will interact. We all have our different ways of interacting. But the fundamental is as long as you know how to communicate, tell them these things are expected. These things are expected. I was sharing an experience with um, Lola earlier on, um, but this couple, they're in the US. They're an older couple, like in their 50s. Their daughter that had um, autism, she was 26 then, that was like five years ago. She fell in love with a guy that had Down syndrome. The guy too was 26. At first, the, the guy's parents had no problem with it, they were okay. But the girl's parents were shielding her too much, like, to both of them have um, special needs. How will they cope? You know, they were afraid. But somehow, they managed, and now they've been married for five years, and they have a child, and their child is very normal, very normal and active, no disability. But the mm. parents are not there living their lives. It means somehow they managed, and they manage well. So sometimes we don't give our children so much credit than they deserve. We just feel, okay, you want to shield them. Especially Nigerian parents. We don't talk about sex is like a bad omen. Oh, don't touch this boy. Don't let this girl touch you. Uh, don't touch the boy. They, you, then you have a lot of young adults or older women or older men in their 30s, almost getting to 40s. Like a, a lady was shouting. She was joking. My friend, she was joking. She's like 35. She's a year older than me. Last week, she was just shouting, you see, all these lame boys not touch. You see where it has landed me. I'm not married. I'm still single. <laughs> That's what she was saying. <laughs> it was very funny. But it's the truth. You get so I think we have a lot of, we have a huge role to play by telling them what to expect. I always say, once my daughter hits 13, I will tell you about boys. I'm even blunt from the beginning because my dad was a medical doctor. So... My dad was buying our sanitary towel. My dad was the one that said, you might not be having sex now. Because, you know, doctors see a lot of things. But let me tell you one secret. If you like the guy, when you want to get married and you like the guy, the guy likes you. Maybe you decide not to have sex and you're holding on. Make sure you touch him from time to time and look down to know if you experience arousal. So you don't get married to one man that you say, okay, I'm a virgin, I'm holding myself. And then when you get married, when it's time to perform, nothing is standing up. So you'll be like, I'm not saying you should have sex, but just be conscious. Open your eyes to you look down. Because a lot of men lie a lot. They might tell you, okay, oh, it's okay. I respect your opinion. You want to be a virgin to marriage. But they will not tell you they have issues with potential. It was my dad that was saying it. So you can imagine the kind of relationship we had as children with him. Because he has seen different things in medicine. So he was seen from his own experience. So I like to say, parents, we have a lot of role. Let our children know that this is what is expected at this age. Let's not judge their experiences or choices. Then become their friends. Encourage them to express themselves so that if they are battling with these emotions, you are the first person they'll come to. And if you become the first person they come to, it's easy to guide them. But if our, parents, if our children can't talk to us about these things, it means they begin to listen to strangers from outside. And strangers' advice are not always very good at all. So mm -hmm. from 13, 14, let's talk to our children about sex. Let's talk to them about, okay, who do you like in school? Is there any person you, you are beginning to like? What's her name? What's his name? Last Sunday in church, our pastor was brought his son to the altar not like physically, but brought his son's name up. He now said that he went to his son's room and saw love later from his son to one Amina. His son wrote, Dear Amina, I really like you. For me to get to know you, let's do our homework together. Ah, 
You know, Shade, he say, he said Tolu now has a girlfriend though. So he said, Tolu, come, come, come. Who is Amina? Tolu now said, is this girl I like in school? Daddy, I really like her. She's so smart. Ah. Then the person, the person now said, uh, that means if you like Amina, should we now name you Amino? So everybody just started laughing. Like, okay, we give you house her name Amino. Since you like Amina, please, I want to meet this Amina. And the next day, he dropped his son in school. Because his son is 30 years old. Amina is 12, but they are in the same class. So he saw Amina. He said, hey, Amina, how are you? Uh, what, what class are you? Like, what's your best subject? You know, getting to know Amina. So now because he's aware that his son likes Amina, he knows that his son is beginning to experience puberty emotions. So if anything is happening with him, he can go and meet his dad and say, mm, I've been thinking about Amina a lot. Um, I don't, anytime I think about her, maybe I experience Arosa, what should I do? Do you understand? And you can begin to say, maybe you can invite Amina over, you discuss assignments, you can play games where we can see you, oversee you, you know, you can talk about the things that you love. It's okay to experience Arosa because your hormones are working over time at this age, but you have control over your emotions and you can decide what to do you know, do they teach you sex in school? Okay, no, we don't really talk about it. Okay, sex is when a man and a woman come together. You experience it. All these emotions are trying to tell you that because you like this person, this boy or this girl, your body is longing for them. You want to touch them. You want to hold them. But because you know there are consequences for things like that for now, you can channel these things into things that you love to talk about. So we are the ones that will discuss this and channel their attention and give them healthy ways of managing these emotions and healthy things they can engage in. Now, at least reduce that hormonal balance. Everything is self-discipline. If you want to indulge, if you think it's time for you to indulge sexually and your body and your mind is ready for the consequences, then fine. But there's an age for everything, both mentally, physically, and all that. So until they are not ready, there's no need carrying the consequences of that. It's okay to even tell our kids that sometimes these emotions come and go. Today, you can like Amina. Tomorrow, maybe you start liking Samantha. So is it everybody you like you want to have sex with or you want to touch their bum bum or you want to hug them? No. So that's why is we're the ones that have to channel these conversations and direct them and telling them that it's okay to have these emotions. It's how you handle it. It's okay for a boy to like you or for a girl to like you because you are a normal human being that needs love and have a lot of love to give. So as long as we don't shield our kids and we talk about these things with them and we help them channel that energy into something positive, I think they'll be fine. So sometimes we don't give, our, we underrate the power of our children. We shield them so much from so many things and then you start hearing this pastor's daughter is pregnant. Pastor's son has pregnanted somebody. I'd be like, but is this not the person that teaches us on the pulpit? It's because they don't talk about these things. And if our, parents, our kids cannot come to us and express themselves, then why are we there, really? Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Could Jennifer, ask, you know, she talked into different things. And while she was speaking, you know, I remember growing up as a teenager and, um, there was this song by um, Oye Kawenu and um, King Sonadi, wait for me. You know, how they were like, okay, it's good to love someone, but you have to wait because you have children. It comes with responsibility and all of that. For me, those were when songs were sung, I mean, <laughs> made sense. You will look at that, okay, what does it mean to have a child? What does it mean to care for it? Am I really ready to have sex right now? And I mean, when you were saying that, that really drove it home. But like you said, the parent have huge huge role in explaining as opposed to shielding don't talk about it what do you mean you know i was saying to uh, <laughs> coach jennifer before uh, earlier i said i remember when i was crushing on some boy i think i was 13 or 14 then and then we just exchanged each other's picture and my mom found the picture and she beat me so bad i'm like mommy what did i really do like well oh, that's how it starts you know i'm like i don't understand i, I just you know we just exchange pictures but you can, you can imagine when I now my wife now of course I know better now and most of us know better. Now. Okay, like the, she gave the example of uh, Amina and Aminu, you know, like okay, 
what should we expect? What should we do? You know, she's your friend. We have to now guide you as well. And that's also the same for individuals with special needs or in disability. I'll quickly take some comment right now. So I don't, I don't want to be selfish. Like we're speaking to someone ourselves alone. I'll take some comment from our audience. Then we'll go on a one minute break after the, the comments. And then we'll come back to discuss further. I also want Antipolani to share one or two things with us. And then Toby, there was something you said to me that it's not of my, I mean, I've not gotten out of my brain since. They're going to share with us and tell us how you overcame that. And then maybe we'll talk about how to, I mean, deal with rejection because I want definitely some individuals with special needs actually experience that. How do we, I know you said something about you are enough and all of that, but in the practicality of it, how do we do it? That even individuals without disability also do, I mean, people tell you, no, you're like, ah, What's wrong with me? Am I not good enough? How do we deal with that? So I'll go quickly to the comments because I saw some comments and I need to actually read them out real quick. So everyone is excited that we're talking about this and they're saying happy Valentine's Day to us all. So happy Valentine's Day. Toby and Tibalani, welcome. Um, um, could Jennifer, everyone is welcoming you to the show and they're glad we are talking about this. Um, so parents building self-confidence is very important. That's what Basira, thank you, Basira. Um, Arisha, but that's my dog in the house. Thank you, doctor, for saying that. Um, uh, okay, so someone also reiterated the fact that you always have choices to like someone who like me. Like, it's my choice if I like you or not. You, you, you don't, I don't have to so to say, beg you or it's my choice. I have a choice as much as the person has a choice whether to accept the relationship or not. Um, it's also... Um, it's ableist, ableist thinking to see a person without a disability as a hero for dating a person with disability. Yeah. Right. And why should that person be an hero? Why? I want you, you to saw something in me. Absolutely. And I have to look and find something in you too before you can. You're not doing anybody any favor, for goodness sake. So please, let's erase exactly. that mentality. Let's clean it yes. off. Let's it's have a mentality to die in that around death quickly. So it's a matter of choice. You can't force yourself on me. Neither can I force myself on you. We are without disability. We have to be sure we, we, there's there's compatibility, and then we, we do it as it ought to be. Then um, yeah, someone else says something here. Okay, research shows that people with disability are perceived to be asexual. I think I read something like that before. Also, you know, yeah, like that's a big thinking again. Yeah. So we might talk about that's that. That's that's yeah, to, during, after the break, please let's address address that also. Thank you for that, um, Doctor um, um, Basirat. Uh, okay, I think um, some of every other thing was just reiterating what um, Killer Autist says. Of course, um, people with disabilities have emotional needs. Absolutely, exactly. they're human first before the disability. Um, okay, love and acceptance has nothing to do with race. Ability or disability. It's a fundamental need for everyone, according to Coach Jennifer. Thank you for that. Um, Basirat says, not sure about equating a nasty attitude with Down syndrome or a disability. But I think, um, I I'm sure it's not like a general thing, what Dr. Um, Coach. No, it's not. Yeah, I I I'm sure you're like, if you have an issue, you have an issue. So, whether yeah, that it's yeah, I, I remember the part of, I, I'm a Christian that says, if you want to be friendly, show yourself friendly. So if, if you are nasty, it, 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 it's also sure that you are not friendly. And of course, um, it could also hinder a good relationship. Okay, some of our parents, some of our parents use fear as a tool to guide us. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Someone yeah. said, if you don't tell them what it is, a, a stranger will tell them and will expose them to evil things that you don't, what you're getting them for, they will expose them to it in a negative way. So why don't you do the job yourself? There's nothing to shy away from, you know? I said, my kids are half toddlers. They call the penis, the penis, the vagina, you know? I tell them, don't, yes, you know, Paul don't joke about, look at your bum bum, you know, when they're about to have a shower. I said, we well, don't joke about that. This is somebody's private part, you know? Talk to them about what it is. Not giving it some name, butterfly, chin chin, no. <laughs> <laughs> Give it all what it is. So, um, Joan says that sometimes we don't give our children so much credit. Parents tend to shield that. Yeah, we know that. Please, let's say it as it is. Let's talk to them. Look, when we show them the way, they trust us more and they can defend themselves. You know, 
I, I, I had a case where a young girl came home and said to the mom, mom, this friend of mine asked me to um, um, pull down my pants. And I said, no, you know? And, and the mom was like, why? She said, because you told me it was wrong. Maybe he didn't know it was wrong. I said, no, and I, and I left, you know? Imagine the mother had not told her, you know? So let's, let's this is this for me, it's, it doesn't have to do with, with a disability or not, but it is the reality of what is going on and we have to say it as it is and also ensure that we, we build our, our teenagers and young adults towards healthy relationship. You know, yeah. Coach, Coach, um, Coach Jennifer said, a friend in her 30s says, they said we should keep ourselves running from boys. Boys must not touch you. Girls must not touch you. Now we're telling something. Where are the boys? We need them to talk. <laughs> How do we get <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. we've got a short break and then we'll go to the circle again just ask one or two questions before we call it a day so we're going to short break real quick please do not go anywhere we'll be right back thank you <laughs> D-Y-S-L-E-X-I-A he give anything to make it go away even though he knows it's here to stay Buckets, he won't give up, no, no, cause you know he's way too tough. He's gonna do whatever it takes, he's gonna find a way. Casey never liked school much, all the kids would laugh when he read in class. Teachers tried to help him out, but they didn't know what to do, so they just let it pass. Sometimes he wanted to scream out loud, hide his head in the sound of the clouds. D-Y-S-L-E-X-I-A, he could be anything to make it go away, even though he knows it's here to stay. Buckets, he won't give up, no, no, cause you know he's way too tough. He's gonna do whatever it takes, he's gonna find a way. Hello. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. Can you see me? Can we all, can we, can we start? Yes. yes, you can see me. Okay, yes. I think yes. my uh, my system is a bit slower. Okay, so um, I would want us to um, address, I, I'll go back to it, but I can't see her, but I'm sure my system will reset itself while we're having this conversation. Um, I know that I've been, um, I, there was something I heard, and this is a true life story, where um, someone said to me that um, a parent of a child, which, uh, not a child, a young adult with um, disability was like, oh, you work with people with um, disability. Why don't you help us arrange for someone to get married to this other person? And she, I mean, yeah. would pay, you know, like would pay, just, we just want this person to get married. And I, I, I just thought of it like, what is relationship all about? What is marriage all about? Should it be? Should that be the case? So, Auntie Balala, I'm bringing this to you. While you're speaking, I'll be going for a bit, but I'll be right back. Um, I'm bringing this back to you. What should, what you, um, in your own experience, and uh, for me, just like when we're saying, um, you know, we're saying don't touch boys, don't touch girls, and then you're in your thirties, you're not. I mean, we're thinking, well, what's happening here? What should, what should it look like in preparing a person for a relationship? So, for example, I know that you've had, um, you talked about um, the person that Muni liked, and now you uh, 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 arranged for uh, a date where they had to go to the cinema together. Could you just tell us, um, share such ideas with her? Because that's what leads to, if I'm not mistaken, relationship like that would lead into something more deeper. But what should it look like? So that we don't just wake up and say, oh, he's going to get married to this person. Can we do an arrangement kind of marriage for individuals with disability? That for me shouldn't be if we do our own work right from the beginning. So Antipolani, could you please walk us through that um, discussion? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omolola. This has been a very exciting and enlightening session so far. First, I must commend Toby's parents. 
very excellent and empowering parents. They built her up with a lot of confidence, self-worth, and the knowledge that she can make choices. Excellent. Nothing beats that. So, Toby, when you please tell, give, give your parents a big thumbs up from me today because they've done an excellent job with you. And um, yes. I will let them as well. Know. Excellent. Yes, yes. <laughs> And with Coach Jennifer, I, I like the fact that um, she definitely knows her onions in terms of telling us all the things she said. You know, it's even so broad, such that this, what, what she shared with us can also be used with the typically developing children as well. You know, telling them mm -hmm. um, not to judge their ex experiences, for them to be, for parents to be their children's friends, be able to express themselves with them and all of these things. These are definitely things that would help. Coming specifically to um, your question, and whilst we're talking all along, it, it dawned on me that, um, yes, we're talking about disabilities, but also in my, I felt to shed a bit of light on some types of disabilities where the children or the adults cannot express themselves. You know, it's mm -hmm. a different thing. Toby can talk. We have other people mm -hmm. that can express themselves, they're vocal, True. and they know how to go about it. But for some people who cannot, there has to True. be a definite, deliberate effort to contrive sure. the situation for them. So with such children, um, it's very important. Well, I keep saying children because I think I always start with children first and then adults. But with yes. such adults, yes. it's important that you, you help them know to establish boundaries. Mm -hmm. You help them prepare scripts for them. So at the very beginning, they're actually reading mm -hmm. what they're going to be saying to um, the partner or to whoever it is they're interested in. Yes. They start yes. out as friends first. So you start out as a person's friend. Relationships don't just happen. So you start out understanding that this is... So you give them scripts on what to say. Ask them how they feel first. Once they've expressed it, you write it down for them and they can read it for those who can read. For those who cannot read, you sign it for them. So there's always something to help guide them. You help them understand the um, need for personal space. So they need to understand that we cannot just go straight to you and get in your space. We have to... There has to be mm -hmm. some distance... It's a factor for social distancing now. <laughs> so it even makes it more that you have to, you know, definitely keep some distance between, respect their privacy and all of those things. Also, teach them, you help them develop their self work by helping them keep their Very personal important. hygiene. Very important that they themselves, they don't go somewhere and they're embarrassed because they're smelling, they haven't brushed their teeth or what have you. So personal hygiene, you teach them how to dress nicely. You help them know that when they go, you need to listen more. I mean, of course, they can't express themselves, but you also have to be settled in yourself and appear like you're taking in what this other person is telling you. Don't always be jumpy. It's not a time to be restless and start moving about. You know, the same way with a person with autism um, who is hyperactive. You help them control it in, in a way that you have to sit down. Okay, even if you sit for two minutes, then you can stand, come back again, sit again, and just help them channel it. And also teach them to be gentle. So in, um, mm. in as much as they like the person, they have to understand that indeed we have to um, be gentle with whatever it is that we do with them. So it's very important that we know all these things. And in our planning or in our helping them design how to find love and how to get into relationships, these things are at the back of our minds as parents. And yes, you cannot beat the parents' involvement. It is, I think it's the main thing. It, it's not the only thing that helps them start it off. It, parents, parents have to be there. And that's why Toby is the way she is, because of her parents. And um, Coach Jennifer said it as well. So parents are definitely key and very, very instrumental in making the relationships happen. To answer your question specifically about um, helping, I call it arranged marriage or arranged relationships. You know, mm. um, I'll start with myself. I'll, I'll give a personal um, example. So not only do I have a son with autism, I also had a brother with autism. My brother passed mm. three years ago, but um, in his lifetime, my mom actually helped to find him a wife. He died at age 43, so he was quite old. I mean, he, he, got, he got old enough to understand things. So she had actually, she tried it twice. The third time, nobody told her before she didn't attempt it again because both relationships <laughs> failed woefully because mm. it wasn't mm. something that he chose by himself. They were just people who oh, thought, okay, I wanted to have a baby, I wanted to have a child, and you know, she was very worried and bothered about that, and she went out of her. I have sworn I would never do that. God help hmm. me. 
God help Moni find his own relationship and find the person he loves by himself. And the person who loves him will find him by themselves as well. Mm -hmm. My Very role true. in it is to help him. Yeah, my role in it is to help him understand how to approach that person, how to mm. get into the relation, things that you do when you're in that relationship, but not to help you choose somebody because those things, if you don't choose for um, typically developing people, why would you choose for a person with autism and then they, or, or a person with special needs? And then they feel like they're doing us a favor by marrying mm -hmm. our children or by being around them. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Say, if anything at all, Rich. the person with special needs is doing them a favor because not only is this person helping them um, understand life, the learn patience, even learn patience. Yes. Mm. Yeah. They're learning a lot of skills. Patience, yeah. There's so many skills they themselves will learn from the person Empathy. that has disability. You learn yeah. a lot. Mm. You know, and, and they even learn, to, they learn some skills because some of these people with special needs have more skills than we do. So if they have all yeah. the skills that they're bringing to the table, they're teaching you all this. Uh, so when you come there and think you're doing them a favor, hello, there's, there's, no, there's no favor. Mm -hmm. So that for me is not something. So part of what I desire is I desire for Moni to get married in life. Yes. God, uh, God help us. I mean, God's will be done. But in his getting married, we, my husband also is of that school of thought. We are not the ones to find him his wife. He will be in a, what we, our role is to place him in an environment. So I like Toby's parents as well, who put her in social environments from a young mm -hmm. age, where she Areas. A, 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 from the estate party. They couldn't. So I'd say with Moni, we take him everywhere, every single place mm -hmm. we go to, we take him there. And if it's a place that we feel we have to be extra cautious, we announce him. Please, our son has come. He's going to flick your switches, though, but that is it. <laughs> He's going to flick your switches. <laughs> me, that's who he is. But, but I'm not going to keep him at home because he's going to flick switches in your own environment. He has to be in that mm -hmm. environment, and that's the only way he that's the only uh, way he starts to learn how to behave appropriately. Because he goes and he mimics other people. He gets to know good from bad, and he starts to display True. and do all of those things. So pretty much, mm -hmm. I, I think um, if, if those things are in place, I don't think they should ever arrange um, a marriage for a person with special needs at all. I think they should be allowed mm -hmm. to, but they should be led to, and they should be guided as it is happening with all the scripts and all these other um supports that they would need thank you thank you so much oh my god i love you auntie balale can i say this over and over again thank you for being so real thank you for being so real toby love i, I know you're going to give it to us as it is <laughs> <laughs> so you know there was this um, there, there was um there was a you know we read a comment that says which just shows that yeah. people with disabilities perceive are perceived to be asexual asexual. I want you to address that. What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, the research has shown that yeah. based on and then secondly, that's secondly, that's secondly before you go to before you answer that, you're gonna tell us mm -hmm. that experience you said to me. I want you to say to us where someone said, Oh, you know. Yeah, living with um cerebral palsy. So anybody that approaches oh, that you, one, uh, say yes. I want to yes. that to us publicly too. Thank you. <laughs> as well, Ali. <laughs> don't worry, pick your jaw off the floor. <laughs> There's nothing I haven't heard. <laughs> no. I'm serious. There's nothing I haven't heard. Now let's let's go back to the Iblis thinking that says people with disabilities are asexual. You, you see that thing, eh? Well, I ask, who did they, who came up with that idea? Obviously not people with disabilities. People with disabilities are not asexual. So nobody asks the person with a disability whether they have sexual feelings that person to them. No. This is just, this is just a thinking. So this is how people without disabilities assume they know what people with disabilities need. And sometimes, I've realized that sometimes they're not doing it out of spite too. They're doing it, they're trying to be nice to you. <laughs> In their mind, they're trying to be nice to you. So they, they then assume they're supposed to be asexual. So they'll say some stuff like, oh, after, with all the problems you have in your life, you have the, where do you have the energy to be thinking about man? Mm -hmm. Or sex? Or even or even sexual fitness? Like, should you even be having those kind of thoughts? Shouldn't you be worried about your life problems? Mm -hmm. And that's that how, way. that's how that mindset of asexual people with disabilities came. So, it, it's it's the same reason why if you want to oh and Bali has ah and Bali has a boy if you had a girl out that said let's let's do something take your girl with a disability to a family planning clinic in Nigeria <laughs> hey 
and then you will hear the things that would shock you to your bones. And then it'll be like, really, you? So people like you too are thinking about it. Like, the, the nurses will decimate you. Hmm. <laughs> You'll be so... It's always so interesting. Like, you're not supposed to even be thinking about these things. Not to talk of even verbalizing those thoughts. That's how society hmm. thinks about it. Hmm. Same thing with... I mean, I, I remember this when I was about my mid-twenties. So that was the age where all my friends were getting married. So my friends, my cousins, those of us that, most of us that grew up together, a lot of people were like getting married at that time, for getting engaged and all, for, you know, hooking up and all. So, um, I remember that I'm seven at this point and my, one of my, you know, aunts, one of my great aunts, she calls me on the phone and she says, when are you coming home? So I'm like, ah, oh, that, hey, auntie, I should come home for Easter. So she's like, hey, when you come home for Easter, make sure you see me, it's very important. So, you, and you know how in a Nigeria, in a, especially a Yoruba household, they tell you that they say an important meeting. You know how that, you know how these meetings go, right? They're already in your mind, they're already calculating. What did I do? Who did I, who did I insult? What did I say? <laughs> that is about to cost me a family meeting. So I get home and they're like, hey, I've been waiting for you. So you're like, okay. Ah, I shall find out what my offense was today. And then you get into the meeting. And then, my, you know, this my great aunt says to me, you know, Toby, as I've been really thinking about this matter. It's, it's a very, the matter is very, very important to me. I said, okay, ma. She says, you know, I just wanted to tell you. I open your ear and listen to me. Or don't start speaking English. That you see, you know the way you are. And so, you know, because of the way you are, see, eh, any man that just says he's interested in you, you are not the type of person. And she said this thing in Yoruba. So I'm trying, so a lot of things are getting lost in translation. So it's not people like you. Let me try and translate. So it's not people like you that will be being picky. So any man that just says he's interested in you like this, just say yes. Wow. I looked at her. Like, yeah. like it, see, in her mind, see any man that just says he wants to marry you, just say yes. Yeah, submit so yourself. Don't, don't say yes. It's not people like you that get to pick. But I understood where she was coming from. That that's the world view from. Mm -hmm where she was coming. So I didn't even, honestly, I didn't even get upset. I just said, ah, thank you very much, ma. I've heard you, ma. And I walked away. And I honestly did not get upset about it because it wasn't, it wasn't new. I, I mean, this is the same me that people told my parents to throw me away when I was born. So come on now. <laughs> it's okay that at this point, I'm not in my 20s, they are telling me this. I mean, they've come up with another shade of it, which is just say, yes, I marry anything or any anything yeah. that shows up with a trust that says he wants to marry you. I mean, my dad, of course, they wouldn't say this in my dad's presence because they know my dad would my dad would be like, are you all normal? You know, so, but again, you see, this, this thing, they come from this, I, again, this mentality that if somebody that does not have a disability is with somebody with a disability, then the person mm -hmm. is doing the person with a disability a favor. That's the kind of thinking that, and, and you see, it comes from it comes from home. If if my if my dad had not deliberately, both my parents, I mean my mom, people used to say my mom used to as a baby, my mom used to dress me to the ninth. And people would be like, Why are you over yeah, dressing up for this kid who can't even walk? But my mom is like, Look, my friend, my children are going to look good, irrespective of whether she's able to walk or not. She's still going to wear the best shoes. Because again, it's all about the sense of self-worth being built into a child very early so that it hmm. teaches you that you have choices. I mean, I, I mean my, my dad and I would, I remember even as a teenager, I remember my, I think it was my first relationship in secondary school. I think I was maybe 14, 15 at this time. And I was dating this guy. And I remember when that relationship was going to end, I had a conversation with my dad and I told my dad, you know what, I am done. I'm done with this. I'm not doing this anymore. And my dad ha and I had a conversation about, you know, what were the pros and cons? Why was I saying I wasn't doing this anymore? And she was like, you know what? Yeah, I mean, it's not obviously this relationship is building you back. You want more for your life? Fine. Go ahead and hand it. And of course, my dad was like, do I need to feed you chocolate while you're dealing with your broken heart? I mean, these, these were the kind of conversations I grew up having. But mm. I've also then realized, like, and Bali said, Parents have a role. But your role is not to make the decisions. Your role is to coach your children into making the right ones. 
and then not to put any pressure you see again it goes back to that thing you said about you know your mom wanting your brother to have children i'm thinking why she had other children that probably already gave her grandchildren though. but then they fix it on, so it's it, it's those fixations that lead to these conversations around arranged marriages or no arranged marriages. They are fixating on the mm-hmm. wrong things. And it's, it's interesting. The same parents that most likely, the parent that is asking them to come and arrange marriage for their children, their children have been locked up in their house for the last 20 years. Though. You no, have not allowed your child to sleep. <laughs> no, she don't have zero. The child has had zero social interaction with their pairs over the last twenty years. Then all of a sudden they are thirty-five. They are looking for a wife for them. I, I'm not understanding. Please make it make sense. If you hmm. know that you you either want your child to live a full life or you don't. I'm so sure. as you lay your best, you let it slide. Hmm. If you have not allowed your child to interact, even if, even with non-verbal, I mean, if you for anybody who has you know, either taught in an inclusive school, even children that are non-verbal make friends. True. And it's interesting how their pairs who are verbal tend to understand them better than even you, the so-called adults in the room. Yes. So it's not about mm-hmm. the fact that the child is non-verbal, the child is blind, or the child is deaf. That's not, that has nothing to do with it. A lot of the times, the reason that the parents have not allowed their children to have proper social lives is that they're too, they are too concerned about their own comfort and their own images that they, they put those things at the expense of their children's social life. Because some, and then sometimes maybe in their mind, they thought these children won't live so long. So they, let's not bother. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, if they are not bothering, the children have refused to die. And now they are adults. Now you're stuck. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. The lies you see. No, I, no, we are very as it is. Weird. And this is everybody's, I mean, Toby can speak I, about it because she's living it. Do you understand? So it's I not coming from, very, you know. I, I'm living this thing. I've seen it. I, I have a personal experience of it. I had an older friend. So I had an older friend when we were growing up who had to be. She was older than me. She was probably seven, eight years older than me. And this same conversation I'm having with you. Now my siblings and I have that conversation every time we, we think about that family. And we're like, oh my God. Because because they did not deliberately put this girl in social systems, social you know situations growing up. Now she's almost she's in her mid forties, and well, she still lives with her parents. I mean, her mom's retired now; her dad's late. So the question is, what next? And nobody mm-hmm. knows. So people now try to ask me what next. I'm like, eh, you push me, guided you. She's older than me, please. Am I supposed to help people figure out what's next for her? And you know, you, you are deliberate. You know what you want. It's not a matter of anybody can just, me. anything goes. I'm like, eh, the difference was clear. When we were growing up, oh, you guys were investing in social interaction and education for me. My father said that he did not have money to waste on a child that was disabled. <laughs> eh, here we are now, now. So everybody has laid their bed, all lying inside the bed that we laid. At this point, my father is not in this, is not sitting down saying, because you see, a lot of the times, let's be let's be honest. Parents who say, I'm looking for somebody to arrange a marriage for my child, is basically, I'm looking for a caregiver. True. I'm looking for somebody to transmit the caregiving roles to. Mm. Because if your child was living a full life, already living a full life, and they were contributing in their own way, to you know everyday living society and everything you will not be worried about let them come and go and marry have children you'll be focused on helping them maximize their contribution to society but because you've not even given them a chance to to contribute that's the only thing you think they have to offer procreation Hmm. Hmm. and that's why people are fixated on procreation at this point in my father's life i don't think he's he's fixated on procreation in any way (laughs) because right now he looks at everything that I'm able to do, and that gives him a lot of joy. Once in a mm-hmm. while, he's like, Sharp, bring your head up from work for a minute to and see me. I'm thinking, Guy, the guy there, you have six grandchildren. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> You'll be okay. You know, so it goes back to what did, what was your, I, and that's why when I'm speaking to parents today, when I'm working with families and I'm helping them. I sit them down and I say, you know what? It's not about my child needs to go to school. Mm-mm. The child needs to go to school. Why? What's the end goal here? What's the big picture? Because it's the big picture that it now determines what the steps are. Yes. Because the, mm-hmm. the big picture determines small steps. 
if from get go you've all said everything that this child is capable of doing, I want this child to be able to maximize. So again, relationships, marriage, dating, all of that now becomes an aside that's to everything true. else. And that and yeah. that is it. I mean, and and again, parents, ah, I beg you by the message of God, please. I know that you love your children with special needs. I know. I know that you really love them. And I know that you want to shoot them. But guess what? You are not the one living with special needs. Newsflash. So, sorry. I, I, I know. I know you love your child. But there are certain decisions that are not yours to make. Irrespective of how much you love your child, it's not your decision to make. Just like Andrew said, it's not a decision to make who money marry. Because, hey, it's not her life. She has already chosen her own husband. She went as well just, you know, that's the decision that was <laughs> hard to make. She has made it. She doesn't mm-hmm. get to sit down. She makes a decision over who he marries or how many children they have. That's not her choice. Her job ends with coaching. And so, when I hear, so, so I've heard parents say to, I mean, I, I was, I remember that I was on a group, I was on a cerebral palsy group recently. And a mother was saying of her 13 year old child, that oh she's sure her child will never get married or have children. So at this she point, she's actually con- the child. Yes. Yes, yeah, she has she's made up, she has made up her mind. This is now. So as far as she's concerned, though, she's actually looking for a doctor that will agree to perform a hysterectomy on a 12-year-old child. Hmm. 12 uh, year old. Hmm? At that point, the conversation. I had to say, sorry, how is this your decision to make? Like, have you even asked your daughter what she wants? And then you're like, oh well she doesn't talk so i'm like the fact that she doesn't talk doesn't mean she doesn't communicate she can communicate somehow and that doesn't mean that she suddenly i don't think and the fact that nobody doesn't even communicate doesn't mean they automatically lose urgency over their own bodies while i agree that yes girls with disabilities are at higher risk for sexual assault and rape it's still the, the answer is not for you to now take over the agency their agency over their own reproductive organs and decide that they should get it directly. Your job is to protect your child and teach them to protect themselves. So again, Very these are all, you know, these are all like layers of the same thing. Whatever you have to, when your child has special needs, I know that it's tricky. I know that it's extremely hard, and I know that there are spectrums. And it's and society will tell you a million things that you shouldn't expect of your child. But again, you make those decisions very early. I, I have children that, I mean, which I, my kids, some of the kids that I work with that have special needs. By the way, oh, today is, I'm sure that tomorrow I'm going to be getting a slew of Valentine card pictures from their mothers. Because these kids, a lot of them, a lot of them, some of them quite non-verbal, but you would be shocked at the relationships they've already built in school. Mm-hmm. And these children, and you know children of that are days, they make themselves Valentine cards or Valentine's Day. Sometimes I just start laughing. I'm like, <laughs> the kind of things we couldn't have tried in our own time. Our mothers would have killed us. But okay. You know, and, and you can basically you say, and you see relationships already blossoming just because parents now know to put their children in social mm-hmm. circles. And these children are beginning to build their own relationships, make their own friends. And that is the, that's how relationships that would, you know, eventually become marriages blossom. Hmm. It's the number of Thank social settings that children you know. If wow. they don't have the opportunity to set it, nothing will happen. So I guess wow. I rest my case. <laughs> my God, this had been eye-opening. Like there's some things we thought we knew, but hearing it for real, like firsthand, drives it home better, you know. And you're thinking, you know. And all we're saying is first accept this child for who he or she is, you know. Early intervention, where is this child going to? What are the things? Don't think on, oh, my child must speak alone. Oh, my child must, um, it's only, I just want physiotherapy. Holistically, what, I mean, be, beyond that age, is going to get to the age of relationship. What are you looking at? That's why that individualized education plan is very important. Transitioning, what is the next thing? So we have to look at it holistically, you know, and then what does this child want? It's not just about what you want. What does, this, what does the child mm-hmm. want? Because that child will come an adult someday. And then you're thinking, well, he never made any change by himself because he never allowed that child. Whether the child is baba or non baba, uh, whatever it is. That's another tip. <laughs> the child never knows mm-hmm. how to make decisions because they never made one. <laughs> <laughs> we we have so much to talk about, but we don't have enough time. But before we go, two questions real quick for 
coach because we don't know we're going to have you here again two questions no to be said something about um teenage girls who are more at risk of getting i mean sexually harassed and i remember having this conversation with when i was in the u.s that i had some teenage girls with special needs were always taking pills and i know this has to do with culture beliefs religion and all of that so you've been a nigerian what imp what would you what would be your take on that one for teenage girls having to have um family plan, plan, planning pills and all of that just to like, protect them well i mean I'm, I'm, I'm sure you get what i'm trying to say coach can i get a yes are you there could jennifer i'm here i can hear you mm -hmm. I, did you hear my question the first question i got your question okay and then what secondly um, we also okay. have also seen cases of oh when boys are having erection, um, how they get well, what, how do we manage it? You know, should we should we not and all of that? Some people will say pour water on them and they will direct and all of that. What is the ideal thing based on your study? What should it be for these young boys? And then lastly, how do we deal with rejection from the opposite sex? That's a lot, but please help us out. <laughs> Okay, we are going to start with the first one. Um, for ladies, for teenagers especially, you know, you can, there are a lot of advantages of having sex, but the disadvantages now come when the sex is outside the context of marriage most times. Yeah. As sweet and as beautiful it is, having sex outside marriage, sometimes the consequences are more than when you wait till you're married to have sex. It's not something we push forward in this century because sometimes they tell uh, they tell us or our kids or our teenagers, ah, if you're not having sex, you don't know what's up. You now have the sex and you just say, bah. do you understand? Or oh, it comes with consequences. So we cannot pretend that we don't have teenagers that are having sex. We can't pretend. So for teenagers already having sex, you tell them, okay, you have to introduce um, contraceptives. It's very important because you're having sex now, you're a teenager, you're 16, you're 17, you're 18. We have to talk about, okay, I remember telling a teenager, because the teenager, she's 18, so she has having sex already. So now she said she doesn't want to have sex again. She wants to be celibate until she's married, she's tired. And what happened, why she was exposed to sex was because she was raped when she was 15. Hmm. Sometimes rape can have consequences. It either makes you hate men or opens your eyes to the pleasures that come with sex. There are two ways. It could work both ways, but for her, that was a consequence. I remember when she was 17 and her parents were talking to my mom. And my mom said, she's already having sex. And it's not by shouting and shouting that she's going to suddenly stop. By guiding her, understand why, understand if it at a point it was as if she was addicted to it, and the mom just didn't watch it. So I remember my mom having that conversation with her and said, Okay, talk to her, tell her, even if you are okay, you've decided you don't want to talk, this is what you want. Please use contraceptives. People transfer sexually transmitted diseases here and there. You can get pregnant and you're not ready for the concept. So she started talking to her daughter. Do you know that it was after probing that she even realized that her daughter was raped at the age of 15? Hmm. By a neighbor's son. Her friend arranged with her elder brother to rape her. That was the story. So we can only tell our teenagers. That's why when you start having conversations with them, even if you've not even started building, you can start now. So who do you like? Okay, what do you do at your spare time? You know, just show consign, consign without judgment. If you show genuine consign without judgment, you'll be amazed at what teenagers will tell you, whether you want to hear it or not. It's because first, you've accepted them. Secondly, you're not judging them or you're not raising eyebrows when you see them. Because sometimes we know what some teenagers do, but you're already stoning them before they come to meet you. They will never tell you anything. You crucify them, so what? So if they're already having sexual intercourse, tell them, okay, sex education, the consequences. This is what can happen. Are you ready for the consequences? 
if you are not ready for it, then you can avoid it. It's going to be a process. Well, we begin to introduce find positive ways on channeling that um, channeling the energy. Join a group, a social class, go hiking, you know, go for adventures, even join after school. If you are in school or you're in holiday, tell your parents you want to join like a painting class or something. Let me tell you, everything is the mind, even sex. Sometimes when I hear when men, when they say ah men, men like sex, like, there are still some men that will control their mind and say no. I can overcome the urge. It's possible. So we have to talk about this thing with our children, whether the teenagers are male or female, the side effect, the consequences. Then when you are aware they are already indulging in sexual intercourse, we tell them, okay, now that you're having sex, this is what you do. There's what they call condom. In fact, if you begin to talk to teenagers, you realize that they will know different sexual styles more than you that you're the adult. So we talk about these things with them and we tell them how they can protect themselves and their partner since they are active. Sometimes it's cause the consequences that come and let them choose, come to the understanding that I can decide to wait. And if I don't have power over myself to control my urges, I can just be careful so I protect myself from any health or any unwanted so that's and this is applicable to, and is this applicable to even um, individuals with special needs or disability? I think, Anibalani, what do you think? Is anybody, are we still together? Yeah, I actually, yeah, I actually think that it is. Um, so a lot of the times, what I, I mean, when I speak to parents who have um, children who are severely impaired, especially on the severe spectrum for cerebral palsy, um, when their children are hitting teenage and of course it becomes more it becomes a little bit more difficult in the you know personal care department. One of the things that I do say to parents is it's time to begin to consider birth control. Um, Thank you. especially yeah. This, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So sorry. I, I need to put that out to be sure that it's both ways. Okay. So go, yes. go on to the next one, please. The, um coach. Yeah, it's very important. The next question so, about, about what to do with Arosa. <laughs> yes. Be like but telling, my younger brother. Like the first one of them. Oh, <laughs> tell them this. Arosa, I think he was I don't think to do for boys. Or 14. Because, you know, then uh, when puberty came, if you want to enter his room, normally you enter his room and you, uh, everybody's chilling, playing Scrabble. But at one point, he now started becoming 13. Ah. <laughs> you became <laughs> you can pour water on them you pour water on them okay after point if you pour water on them why you have to explain why you poured water on them will you always mm -hmm. pour water you won't mm -hmm. always pour water now you when they know okay this comes with puberty most healthy men in fact a higher percentage of men around even in the mornings not teenagers normal men mm -hmm. most of them are arose in the morning but it doesn't necessarily mean they're having sex or they want to have sex. The body mm -hmm. just automatically works like that, especially in response to touch, touch from someone they care about or touch from their partners or their spouses. You already see that early morning arousal. So we mm -hmm. discussed with teenage boys that these arousals are normal for some. I remember my dad used to tell my brother that if, he, if it's too much, well, we should go and shower. One, when he showers, he should come and be lifting weights. That it will go, you get jokingly, and it was working for him. So if he says, "Okay, and uh, this, this, this is what I'm," you see him just putting his hand down and just trying to. All of you should not look at me. All of you should not look at me. And start doing jumping jacks or skipping or something. He was channeling his energy so that his arousal will come down. It was practical, but it was working for him. Hmm. So when you um for. I like to tell teenage boys, there are different ways you can control. You can just quickly stand up and have a shower and just go out of your room. Go out of your room, go outside. You know, if you're outside where everybody can see you, just start doing something, maybe outside, downstairs, or you just begin to focus on something else. Somehow the arousal will come down. But if you're in your room, it's easy for you to start saying, ah, let me look for Vaseline. I want to and start masturbating 
or touching yourself. That's because you are within your confined space. Nobody's disturbing you. But if you experience the arousal and you stand up and you say, I don't want to think about this. Let me just go outside. Let me just take a warm cup, a cup of tea or just go and discuss with my siblings or just let them go out of the room. Once they know that anytime they experience that arousal, there's a positive way of channeling that energy and they are used to it. They are indirectly learning self-control at that point. So that you know you don't just give in to every urge. As much as they are there, it does not mean you give in to every urge. Not every time. Imagine if every time a, a teenager becomes aroused, they are just looking for <laughs> the next vagina. That means the world is in trouble now. We'd be in trouble if that was the case. So we begin to teach them earlier how to channel that energy so that we don't encourage masturbation. We don't encourage like ill thoughts that are not healthy at that point. So those are some of the ways you can just guide them and just help them control it. I have a quick then question there. Yes, can you hear me? Quickly? Yes, yeah. but if yes. this arousal, if the arousal is in public, if it's in a public place, how would you suggest they manage that? Yes. Because taking a shower would mean they're at home or going into their room would mean they're at home. But if it happens, if they see a girl walk past and the arousal comes up at such a time in a public place, what, what would you say is the best way for them to address that? Okay. If the arousal happens, arousal happens in a public place. And um, that's why for me, I say if you have a teenage son that is heading towards poverty, you talk about this thing. When you tell them that it's possible for you to see a girl and you like her. And because you like her, your body will respond. Your penis can easily stand up. So if you're outside and that's happening to you, you can just, you can stand up. You can either sit for a while on this chair. You know, arousal does not, um, the penis will stand, is, is blood vessels, is blood vessels that just is channeled down towards the um, male organ. And then you are aroused, especially when you're anxious or you like, you see something you like. So if it happens outside, he can just sit where he is um, quietly after a while or just stand up and excuse himself, probably go to the restroom or just stand up and move a bit. It will come down. But if you tell them that this can happen when you see a girl you like, just understand that after a while it will come down. But if you are growing older and you are in relationships and you like the person and the person likes you, and you begin to have sexual relations, and you ask for permission because you're already in a relationship, and this person likes you and you like the person, it's okay to have sex. Then that arousal, you're already channeling it already. But if they are not of the age, you just tell them it's going to go down after a while. They can sit on the chair quietly and just focus on something else, or they can excuse themselves and just move around within the vicinity. Or they can even stand so, up and if they have the opportunity to talk to the person they like or whoever is passing, if the person gives them a chance and just talk to the person, introduce, I, I want to get to know you, what do you like to do? If you are conversing, you are already focused on the person. You know, After a while, you, you, you feel better. I think it has worked um, practically for a few people within my circle that I know, but I don't know if it applies to everybody though. So would it be correct to say then that the best way will be to teach them once you realize that um, approaching... Like your son, Mrs. Whether, Olanli, yes. your son, uh, yes. has he experienced something like that in public? And well, in how public, was he in, managed? In public, in public, yes, he goes straight to the toilet. He knows himself. He looks for the restroom wherever he is and he goes to the restroom. Can you hear me? For a while and then comes back up. Yes, I can hear you. I'm answering. Can you hear me? I'm answering. Can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? Well, I can I hear, hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Yes. So I was saying that, yes, when it happens to him in public, he excuses himself. I think part of what we had okay. done from an, an early yeah, stage. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes, part of what we had done from an early stage in his Yes, we can hear you. Yes. So what we had done was to help him understand that these things happen, to understand that you're going to get to first. We had helped him know that he was going to get pu pubic hair. He was going to get hair in his underarm and, um, you know, all those, those things. So these were things that we actually specifically taught him. So we were deliberate about the lessons we gave him on those things that were going to happen to his body. 
And we helped him understand also that when you do get aroused in public, when it's not at home or not, not your room, look for the toilet and go in there. So he goes, so for him, he just, you see him going like this, you know, trying to put it in between because he knows that it's not something that everybody's meant to see. So he quickly goes and then he's hiding himself and then he just walks away and goes, we understand what is happening. Some people may do, but even if they do, it still shows that at least he has manners to know that he cannot mm. start wanking or doing whatever in public. So he just goes into the restroom. So yes, um, but I, I think... Yeah, be, yeah. What would be very key is from the time they're approaching puberty to have all these lessons presented to them. So you have mm. them structured. You're, you're deliberate about the structure of the lessons and presentations. Very important, that yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. that to help the child. So the child has all the answers wherever it comes, whether it's at home it just or in school it. or in this place. This is what to do about it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. And the last one, rejection. In one minute, please, could you just answer that so we can go? Okay, oh then God. the last question. The last question, right? Yes, on rejection. <laughs> yeah, the last question. No. Okay. <laughs> yes, well, the last thing, number one, is when you are experiencing rejection, understand number one is you are worthy you are enough whoever chooses to reject you it's on them not you mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with you the person has an issue with themselves that's why they are rejecting you because sometimes when people experience rejection they think that is their fault i'm not good enough he doesn't mm -hmm. like me what have i done this time no mm -hmm. understand that if you are still alive it means you are here for a purpose Understand mm. that that you are even one of the number on Earth's population means you are already special. You have amazing things about yourself that you focus on. So if somebody decides to reject you, it's on them, it's not on you. Whoever mm. feels you are not deserving of their love should go and find who deserves it. But you know you are deserving of love. You deserve it and you are going to attract it if the person is right for you. So if mm. someone rejects you, understand, number one, it is not your fault. Except if you have a nasty attitude or there's really something wrong with you. Because I will not condone bad attitudes. Some people have really bad attitudes and people can't deal with it, so they go. Then that means you have to work on your attitude. If you know there's nothing wrong with you and somebody chooses to reject you or act like they are doing you a favor, it's on them. Understand that, one, you are special. And secondly, if it's too hard to deal with, find the things that you love to do and begin to do them. I've seen a friend of mine that, chan that she was so heartbroken that she had to join a painting class. Now mm. she paints portraits too. The kind of mm. talent that came from my heartbreak. She paints very nice yeah. portraits and people pay for it. So mm. begin to learn a new skill. At that point, find something to focus on. Learn a new skill. Be surround yourself with people that encourage you to be more. People that understand that you are valuable. Because in life, we don't need people. We don't need to surround ourselves with people that think they are doing us a favor. So first, understand that you are valuable. Understand that you are special. Understand that if they are rejecting you, it's not about you. Probably they have something they need to deal with. Because if it's no fault of yours, it means you are already enough. That's the most important thing on how to deal with rejections. Find your circle of friends. Understand that you are worth it and you are special. Understand, okay, why if it's something that you need to work on, why the rejection? Is there anything I need to work on? Fine. If he or she leaves me or rejects me, it means I don't need this person at this point of my life. I should focus on positive things about myself. Begin to write small things you can do. Write down your achievements. Write down the small goals you've achieved so that anything that will help you increase your self-morale or self-esteem, you do that. Then surround yourself with people that are happy to be around you and encourage you to be better. Thank you so much, ladies. Oh, my God. Thank you. We've got past, way past our limit, really. And I want to thank you all. Thank you, Antibolanli. Thank you for keeping it real. Toby Loba, how do I thank you? Oh, Coach Jennifer, thank you so much. I'm sure we've all learned. I have learned so much, you know. Some of the things we overlook, some of the things you think doesn't matter. I can see it all, and I'm so grateful that we had this conversation today. If anyone wants to learn any other thing, there's this um, um, there's something I watch on Netflix called um, 
love on the spectrum. You know, Antipanali was saying some things about how you have to be deliberate and all of that. If you don't know what to just watch that and you can come up with, copy that and come up with plans for your child or what you want for a relationship to be and how you can help the child to understand um, introverted conversations, how to be cultures, you know, and all of that, making choices, knowing that they're enough and they can decide to say you no know or yes to anybody. Thank you once again, everybody. I remain Lola and AK and from... This is it for us today. Mr. Alex, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I don't know how best to thank you, but until I come your way next week, please join us again. Don't forget to like and to subscribe and to turn on your notification icon to join us again. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. It's bye for me and happy Valentine's Day once again. Bye. bye. Thank you for having bye. us. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Y-S-L-E-X-I-A He give anything to make it go away Even though he knows it's here to stay Buckets he won't give up, no, no Cause you know he's way too tough He's gonna do whatever it takes He's gonna find a way Casey never liked school much All the kids would laugh when he read in class Teachers tried to help him out but They didn't know what to do so they just let it pass Sometimes he wanted to scream out loud Hide his head in the sound of the clouds D-Y-S-L-E-X-I-A Make it go away Even though he knows it's here to stay But KC won't give up, no, no Cause you know he's way too tough He's gonna do whatever it takes He's gonna find a way